for the card of strength, we have a good choice of Percival's vision. Uh, as we remember from the Arthurian legend, the vision uh, depicted a maiden on a lion and a crown on a serpent. The serpent here is decorated breathtakingly. I at first thought it was a camel until I saw its reptilian eyes. But it's uh, it's a really good stock quality. I really appreciate the artwork. And the lion is appropriate for the card of strength. Uh, either number 8 or number 11 are usually strengths. They're sometimes interchangeable. Uh, but always there's a maiden with the lion to show how... Uh, power is able to guide strength, how power can show up in a gentle capacity like a maiden and guide even such a ferocious beast as a lion, which serves as strength. Uh, the lion and the serpent, or elements of them, are common throughout mythology. There is a Danish king, Knut, uh, at whose burial place there is an engraving in old runes of the lion and the serpent and their biblical associations of the lion and the serpent. The Chinese, of course, have the tiger and the dragon who always fight each other. So there is something special and captivating about that element of the two. But more importantly, in the Arthurian legend itself, there is a certain questing beast that a knight is supposed to def defeat. And the questing beast has both the lion and the snake features present. Despite all of those mythological associations here, yet a stronger one is prevalent, where here the uh, serpent, based on the context, represents uh, the powers of responsibility and justice, because here the crown tells Sir Percival about what awaits him and how he basically deserved it and how it's going to maybe... Uh, make him unhappy, but it's to certain actions that he deserved. And the lion still features as a, as the card of strength, as a typical motif, but I think the serpent here takes precedence because of its presence and interesting context. For card number nine, we have the hermit. And in this case, it's interestingly Lancelot in exile. It's uh, almost somewhat uh, unlikely to think of Lancelot as a hermit, but it's uh, just because the spin of the hermit card is usually different. Many times we see a hermit being a person who carries a light force, which represents the idea that a hermit spends some time in civilization and then brings his knowledge to people to guide them with his discoveries. Here we see Lancelot himself being guided by the distant image of Guinevere after he was chased from the court because he was uh, caught with a seductress uh, Elaine. In some legends, Elaine happens to be his mother instead. But either way, uh, the seductress Elaine, who initiated it and pretended to be Guinevere and trapped him and such. But here Lancelot is different, a different kind of hermit. And because of his particular type of hermitage, he is also healed by the Grail. And it is interesting that he finds the Grail at the time when he is not looking for it, which is an interesting element, of course, not coincidental. And uh, when he was looking for it ferociously, I suppose you could say he was looking for it with the wrong reason in mind. He was looking for it as an object of possession. To some degree, the way he was looking at Guinevere herself. In exile, he was able to find the inner truth instead and allow it to guide him towards the discovery of the Grail and being able to heal his mental wounds. So this is a slightly different spin of the Hermit card than you would see in other decks and the difference would be instrumental for understanding the tone of the reading. For card number 10, Wheel of Fortune, we have Arthur's dream, and that is the dream where he sees the future, the goddess Fortune foresees his success and certain dangers lurking in the waters. I suspect that the dangers lurking in the water, the monsters in his vision refer to the impending betrayal of Lancelot and uh, Mordred's ability to use the instability against Arthur and dislodge him. 
and we even see a dragon here in the water that is slightly reminiscent of Loch Ness if you ask me but might also refer to the origins of the name Mordred itself which has to do with both death and possibly being born by the sea so that would be a fitting name for a dragon in Arthur's vision as far as the goddess fortune herself, some would consider her a um, symbolic representation of the great enchantress Morgan Le Fay, who was tied by scholars to the goddess uh, Madrona or Madrona or Dia Matrona by Roman standards before it became uh, Gaelic. And this goddess presided over the powers of fate themselves. So it would make sense that she would, for one, be benign towards Arthur to whom she is also supposed to be maybe related in her mortal capacity and for two that she would have such powers where she could help him predict the future and thirdly where there is an element of water associated since uh, she had such connotations as well of watery powers. So of course Wheel of Fortune is usually pulled by several different creatures in different directions and here we see several forces trying to pull the wheel in also different directions i think here they're represented by mortal agents but the concept is still the same where uh once fate could be neutral it all evens out as jerry seinfeld would say but it's only because one has to preserve the right attitude and arthur definitely proved that he always preserved the right attitude and that is a good representation of the Wheel of Fortune. For card number 11, probably we have Justice. Usually it is connected to the constellation of scales, and for that reason we would see two scales facing each other at a different position, one sometimes higher than another. Here we see a perfect equilibrium, which is a slightly different but not a completely unusual interpretation. And I also like it that it's uh, the Lady of the Lake in the capacity that I understand and recognize her. I think of her myself as Vivian, although there were other names of her given. But in all those uh, naming procedures, there is one pattern that emerges, that she represents forces of vitality, of life, uh, and uh, they are born of a supernatural agency. And she, in a sense, decreased the fate of man. The background story to this scene is that poor Arthur is fighting yet another knight whose name Pelinor, other than being related to the Fisher King, also itself means in Greek something like to do with the rock. So again, he receives this, the sword Excalibur from the rock and he also gives it back to the rock. But here he goes back to the Lady of the Lake and he receives or uh, begs to get the sword back. And here the sword and the sheath are the part of the scale that is being played uh, in the traditional justice uh, um, way and scene type of thing. So here Vivian decides whether to give or not to give. But in actuality this is not a true decision. It's not that Arthur needs to do anything to get the sword. He already has the sword. He was born to have the sword. He's the only king for generations before or after who has the right to carry that sword. The sword is made for him. It's not about him deserving the sword no matter what happens. It's about the sword being internalized. It's his internal power to rule. It represents him more so. So of course she gives it back to him. She fixes it entirely and Oberon's little masterpiece is as good as new, just as it used to be before. And this is a breathtaking artwork for me. I entirely enjoy this aspect. I enjoy their relationship, the fact that Arthur bows down to forces of nature presented by the Lady of the Lake. It's all very appropriate and I really like it. And card number 12 is, as usual, the Hangman. The difference is that we often see the hangman being upside down. Uh, in animal decks it would be maybe a bed hanging upside down, in human decks it could be a human turned upside down hanging by its ankle with the head towards the ground. Here it's not the case, here the knight is hanging straight from the tree in uh, upright position, which is uh, somewhat a little bit unusual, but uh, Still, it's uh, 
appropriate for the change of perspective that is involved in the act of hanging. Hanging uh, denotes, in a sense, separation from the earth, and in this deck it denotes separation from ordinary mortality and ability to relate to higher realms. The hanging in this uh, context is performed by the uh, psychopath of the medieval times known as Knight Ironside. Uh, it's, it just reminds me of this psychopath joke uh, where a person is trying met somebody they liked at a funeral, so now they're trying to kill more people to meet them again. You probably heard the joke. But that's what Knight Ironside is trying to do. He decided that he wants to meet Lancelot and Gawain in person, so he keeps killing everybody else who comes his way. Until, of course, Gareth that we saw previously in the Lover's Card comes and defeats him. Gareth may not be quite as good as Gawain, but he has his ways and Ironside loses. But until then, Ironside was able to contribute to several good knights, understanding their limitations and getting a new perspective. In real life situations, of course, this does not denote uh, true death or anything like that, despite the hanging act. It's more where you're forced into circumstances, where you're forced to reevaluate what you're seeing, what you're understanding, what the outcome is, and what your wishes are, why the previous wishes cannot happen, why this one needs to change, and all kinds of other practical considerations of this kind where a change in perspective is required. In card number 13, Death, we have, uh, appropriately, Gwyn Apnus, leading the wild hunt and taking out whoever they meet in their way. I personally think that, uh, despite all other interpretations of the name Gawain, uh, including the Gua Hamal uh, in Gaelic, uh, I think that Gwyn would be a likely candidate to bestow his name upon a deadly knight myself, especially because of the sounds of their names, they seem pretty similar to me. Uh, and if you consider how the Welsh would have spelled it uh, in the past, I think that Gwyn might have inspired the character of the knight. Uh, but in this capacity, Gwyn Apnus is the collector of souls, he is the lord of the underworld Anuen, um, and he is responsible for cleansing, purification, he allows to get rid of uh, old habits that no longer serve you. So in a sense, this card, number 13, is the conclusion, uh, or the logical conclusion from card number 12, where you're changing perspective so radically that you're getting rid of something old and instead embracing new ways. So in practical terms, it would be some kind of a major change. It could shake you to your core, but it could be beneficial and would still allow you to corporeally exists, so of course many of you know that metaphorical or symbolic death does not imply actual death, and this is definitely the case with Queen of Nus. Then for card number 14, the Temperance, we have the Maidens of Avalon working on Cauldron of Unwin, the Cauldron of Inspiration. Of course water plays a great role in this mythology Celtic, Irish, English, whichever have you, and definitely Arthurian. We have the Holy Grail being a vessel for water, being the most requited object in that mythos. We have the Cauldron of Inspiration that inspires mortal gods, bards like Taliesin or Merlin. We have uh, the Lady of the Lake, who is the highest uh, agency to which people must appeal for help or fear her judgment as a representative of the powers of water. So this definitely shows that water here has considerable powers on one. And in this case, uh, the maidens here are crafting the vessel for inspiration itself. Temperance uh, often has that association, of course, with the virtue of temperance accepted by Christians in medieval times when they have to tolerate something to learn how to tolerate it and then become better as a result to be steadfast. And we have uh, several mentions of that in different minor Arthurian characters, uh, such as Lacotte, the tail male, uh, who a uh, Sir Bruner who perseveres and becomes greater because of his perseverance in Minor Arcana. So this is definitely a well-made card. 
the face that is being shown here on the card next to the cauldron, it uh, is reminiscent of the face of Taliesin, who was rumored to be one of the first to partake of it. Uh, and uh, maybe to some degree who could be the youngest incarnation of the great entity of the dog, the, the father uh, of the gods who controlled the cauldron of inspiration at its first inception. As the central piece in this deck, we have, of course, the Devil card, and here properly it is represented by the great Horned One Kernunus himself, one of the central lords of the Celtic pantheon, except, uh, uh, of those at least surviving to our times, documented throughout everywhere where Celts lived and the steps, uh, traces of him are found almost everywhere. And there might have been other earlier older gods, but the Romans managed to eradicate enough traces of them, seemingly with the destruction of Ines Moon, uh, all the documents were gone. Uh, at any rate, uh, here he appropriately plays the role of the devil. Why is that so? Other than the horns that Anna Marie Ferguson points to in her booklet, I think there are other aspects. There is this opposition between nature and civilization, between artificial values placed by the Knights of Camelot, and true values that are practiced in nature and natural order by animals of which Hernunus is the lord. Uh, he represents the old pagan ways that opposed the newly arriving Christianity, the pagan ways that were still practiced up to the 12th century, uh, or some forms of them uh, in France, where those romances became so popular. And he has the wider outlook. We see in the picture here that there is the stag, which was his favorite form, of course. We see uh, the fox that would maybe hunt uh, instead of being the prey. So we see that uh, Kirnunas represents this reconciliation of several opposites. He knows the way of the prey, he knows the way of the predator, he understands what is essential, he understands what is true, and his truth is not necessarily his wisdom, they are uncomfortable for the Christian, for the knight, for the male, they are uncomfortable for most of the things that the artificial construction of Camelot represents and in their eyes he should be the devil because he gives them the truth they no longer are able to receive or like. It, with some exceptions we should point out that uh, mysteriously Lancelot the greatest of the knights violates some of the code of chivalry, some of his oaths and he follows the more natural inclinations of his passion instead of the artificial code of honor that is imposed on all the knights of Camelot. So, the greatest of the humans, like Lancelot and Merlin, they have to overcome the human opposition, they have to transcend to the other side to communicate with other values, with greater wisdom. And, in fact, we see Merlin often with the antlers of Kernunus, because Kernunus is the chief lord of all the druids being the lord of the wild. And in this deck we saw instead Nimue who represents more the wilder side of nature in this context and she uh, was surrounded by antlers, not wearing them as Merlin normally would, but she was surrounded by them and as such she represents the wisdom of Kernunus in this way more than even Merlin uh, as he would be presented everywhere else. But Kernunus definitely has a wider presence, he serves as the source of opposition to this order represented in all the other cards, and as such he is the most suitable, the only possible candidate for the card of the devil. For card number 16 we have appropriately the tower, and equally appropriately it is about to collapse. We always see the card of the tower in the stage of disrepair, where it has very strong foundations seemingly, but because of their artificial nature, they, it always coll collapses. We see that in Kabbalistic decks where the great lord from above punishes the sinners, we see it in other decks. And in this case, this is the fortress of Vortigern, who is uh, supposed to be a failed Celtic leader, unlike Ambrosius, unlike Uther, unlike Arthur, he is not able to 
stop the Saxons and he is only able to retreat to an isolated place and build his fortress. And all of that is unnecessary. He has the ambitions of a high king, but he cannot maintain them. And uh, because of that, his fortress cannot be allowed to exist. And his problem was that every time the building would be erected, uh, the next day it would turn out to be destroyed, which serves as a good introduction to the arrival of Ambrosius, who in this case, instead of just being Ambrosius or Ambrose or Ambrosius or Elianus as he's known elsewhere, is just Ambrosius the wizard. So uh, he is conflated with the figure of Merlin of either later or uh, contemporary times. And uh, Merlin here tells him, or Ambrosius tells uh, Vortigan ab about the truth about the building, that there are two dragons fighting underneath its foundations. And of course, uh, the red and the white are well-chosen colors by the tellers of the story. They show up th throughout the entirety of Celtic mythology. They all show up together. Uh, they characterize the great goddess Bridget. They characterize uh, certain cows of Celtic mythology and they might even have given rise to the early uh, versions of the Snow White fairy tale. But in this context they are simply two fighting dragons. The red one uh, of course represents uh, whales and the white one represents Saxons. Uh, it is uncertain why the white one is chosen for their color, but the red one is, of course, the great red dragon of Wales that we already know of. And here, eventually, he will become the star drake and uh, rise to herald a new kind of age. But the problem with Vortigan is that he invited, apparently, the Picts into this land, uh, rather, invited the Saxons to defeat the Picts, and then the Saxons... Uh, the Saxon leaders Hengist and Horsa defeated him. And we don't uh, know the entire history, some of it, or most of it, or all of it might have been fabricated, but here is one of the first tales that we know about Merlin slash Ambrosius and his powers of prediction. Here he shows his awareness of the dragon, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, the advisors of Vortigan wanted uh, to sacrifice a child, by the way, which is an interesting connotation for the Tower card. It also shows up in the story of Abraham in the Bible, uh, and it has similar connotations, where it's a sacrifice that's kind of unnecessary and will not support the foundation that is going to crumble anyway, which happens to this fortress. It can be uh, opposed semantically and symbolically, symmetrically, whichever way you look at it, to the structure of Camelot that we saw in the card of the Fool that Percival was attracted to, because this one, both of them might be built on false foundations, but at least the foundation of Camelot serves a good purpose, where this one serves uh, only the aggrandizement of a fallen king that cannot contribute to his people. And for that reason, uh, it, the this structure will fall much sooner than the, that of Camelot. The star card is always positive here. The great red dragon of Wales we've seen uh, in the previous card uh, finally takes root and flies as a comet across the sky and heralds the future but imminent rule of usurping dragon. It is in fact uh, this appearance of the dragon that allowed the surname Pendragon, which means the head of the dragon. So fire drag here is important, it's a positive sign, and it is shown in such lovely terms on the background where the sky and the earth are opposed to each other, but are connected to its arrival. A very good omen for different kinds of projects. For the card of the moon, we have appropriately Morgan Le Fay. Uh, her powers seem to be of a source that would be instinctive and as such suitable for being driven by the moon or fueling it instead. It seems true that she shows certain attributes that connect her to the goddess Madron that we've discussed before. 
but I would suspect that she probably has other connotations, not necessarily to the Morrigan as some may think, because she doesn't seem to have too many deathly associations, maybe just one aspect of collecting Arthur uh, afterwards in Avalon, I think that could be important, and her water connotation, so she does have one element of the Morrigan features, but the Morrigan had uh, much more than that, and the particular bird-like associations that Morgan Le Fay uh, lacks, but they could have been lost over time for all we know. Uh, nonetheless, I suspect that she has connections to other creatures of mythology. Caridwin in particular comes to mind because of her association with Golden of Inspiration uh, and magical powers, but uh, several of those goddesses would be interchangeable at any rate. It's their specific properties over fate, over shape-shifting, and other powers that are long-term, that are important, and as such, she could be the ideal fairy godmother in fairy tales, or the representation of fate in the Wheel of Fortune that Arthur sees in his dream. So, if those cards come together, then that could be important for interpretation. Uh, I think the artwork here is very effective, where the moon is showing through the trees and is reflected in the water, showing the connection the traditional connection of the moon to the water powers, how it governs emotions, the shifts in mood, the instinctive knowledge, the darkness of the instinctive mind which uh, only few can fathom, uh, which is represented by the trees in this card. And the trees uh, often represent such dark unknown territories also in fairy tales. So again, I personally connect Morgan Le Fay to her fae roots, she is supposed to be the fairy, and many people even consider her the fairy in translations, and I think that is because she is related to our ideas of fairy tale and the instinct guiding us throughout towards success and growth. For card number 19 we have the sun god Lu. I wasn't sure about the choice of him, I like him for Welsh mythology deck, but here we have the Arthurian legend, and Lou does not seem to show too much, except the indirect maybe references, if certain celebrations are taken to be Lunasa or something to which he gives rise. Otherwise, the presence of the sun god, to me, is more evident in Lancelot, uh, to whose roots I would trace the name even. But still, um, I guess his properties of Lou, even though he I, he doesn't seem to belong to that pantheon, to this mythos, but his properties do, the self-reliance, the belief, the ability to find alternative routes towards success. After all, Lou was uh, known for slaying Baylor of the Baleful Eye, the leader of the Fomorians or some version of Lou at least, uh, and he was able to override all kinds of limitations, the gaius of the Irish legends. Uh, so he is very popular, very famous, and he holds aloft the sword, so I would say that it seems like he should be symbolically connected to Lancelot somehow, or one of his fellows at least, but I think Lancelot, even starting with an L, uh, would make mo most sense for being connected to Lou. So, uh, I don't know about his inclusion in the Pantheon, but I like um, I like the artwork, I like that he is depicted again on the natural side as an appropriate for a god in this deck. He is shown where he draws his force, uh, his powers from the forces of nature, he is shown by himself where normally the regular human figures would be part of civilization, civilized structures. He's shown more around some kind of a stony structure that maybe is a vague uh, foreshadowing of Stonehenge, maybe not quite, but something similar in principle and operation. So I like how Lou is presented, but uh, maybe he should have been replaced by a different knight uh, from the Arthurian legend to which this deck ought to be dedicated. And then we have the Judgment, and Avalon is appropriately chosen, the Isle of the Apples. Uh, apples are connected to using in effects in several types of mythology, and it's interesting uh, that the one of the goddesses supervising the Isle of the Apples in some legends, uh, Avalach, uh, was supposed to be that same goddess Madron, so again the connection to Morgan. 
uh, I like the fact that she sort of shows up here indirectly as she was supposed to collect Arthur's soul eventually and Arthur is supposed to return uh, there is a horn in here which is interesting the horn shows up in several capacities sometimes it is used as a drinking horn sometimes to sound things and thus it also shows up in legends itself not just in the deck and uh, I like how it's done. Uh, I consider this to be less of a judgment than some other cards that are judgment in this deck. It seems more like a natural cycle where death, uh, in this case of Arthur after the Battle of Camelin, allows him to recuperate, recharge, to maybe be reborn. And that's where all the legends of the King's Return come from, I think, where he's supposed to return whenever he's needed and that's because it's indirectly a possibility of reincarnation for we know all the idea of the summer lands, uh, summer isles, the isle of the blessed, of legends uh, of Celtic mythology and otherwise could be uh, representative of this concept of reincarnation in, in the less direct terms at least and I like the fact that Morgan shows up here because again her connections with the power of fate, with destiny, with life and death questions is instrumental. For the final card of the major arcana, the world, we have the giant's dance, the uh, friendly structure of Stonehenge that we've seen elsewhere, and that seems very appropriate. It's a co combination of knowledge in a sense, because uh, some say that those uh, structures of Stonehenge is not just a monument to some other civilization, but it's an actual tool for mystical growth and where it could be used for astrological observations or something else, where they ha those stones still have powers to inspire. There are all kinds of legends. And one of the legends mentioned in the booklet uh, rem reminds us of how Ambrosius uh, was... Uh, interested in erecting a monument to his power and Merlin apparently delivered and created those stones and made them do this little dance uh, so it's kind of interesting that's why they're called the Giants dance and the world card is often depicted this way where you have some kind of a dancing figure this is like a female type of goddess similar perhaps to Kali dancing of, on skulls the idea here is that there is a type of order and chaos that are playing off each other where the fool in part represents the chaos and the world, uh, its symmetrical opposition represents uh, order or the other way around, they sometimes switch places but it's that kind of an interplay between chaos and order, between balance, disharmony between new and old so it's a very suitable image for the world card and i like it for this deck and i like that stonehenge feature so prominently in major arcana it's very suitable uh, and it's a good artistic intuition that inspired the author to do so the minor arcana is just as deep in its own way with meanings and artistic uh, efforts of interpretation or reinterpretation but I think in part uh, the meanings there in the booklet are more superficial they give you a few hints here and there but unless you understand how to read between the lines that kind of information is too sparse to interpret it in terms of the Arthurian context in general or terror reading specifically even with that said, I like the fact that there are certain visual themes that show up again and again. The nature, opposition versus uh, orderly business uh, of human civilization, the animals versus humans, pagan versus Christianity, men and women, and all of those oppositions we mentioned before, they all definitely are shown here. But perhaps if you want more in-depth understanding, you would need a guide and you wouldn't even be able to go through it just once. Because enough of the characters here mentioned in the Assyrian context, unless one is a scholar and remembers all of them by heart, it could be very hard to relate them. So 
even so the the cards are all beautiful uh, enough decks would skip on the minor arcane and make them more redundant more plain with just an image of a sword here an image of a cup here and this is not the case here we have a very detailed uh, depiction here of different Arthurian characters Many of them would be best interpreted if guided by the corresponding card of the Major Arcana. For example, all the cards number 2 would be guided by the High Priestess and the particular element would become clear in the context of the reading. But if you just do it for the appreciation of art, then Minor Arcana is definitely just a striking and it's a good depiction of Celtic life, better Celtic deck than most, even the ones that are supposed to be Celtic deck, in my opinion. So again, uh, Anna Marie Ferguson did really well, and she is not just the author of the meanings. So we usually have two authors, one for the concept of the deck and one as an artist. She is the one who did both, and to me that is a really remarkable, a great talent, especially when it's done so well and so consistent. And I would recommend this deck, that, and the minor arcane I'm showing now is just as good, and if you are uh, intermediate or advanced, you should be able to use this deck, even with the clues that I provided and aided by your own intuition, if you are of the intuitive band. If you are less so, you would still need the guide that's called Legend, the Arthurian Tarot, and it comes all together in one book set. So, this is our gothic review of the Arthurian Legend Tarot. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. On if you have suggestions for other decks, feel free to voice them. And I hope you will watch our other reviews of tarot and other versatile spooky reviews from Bedweb Gothic Reviews.